All right, welcome everyone to section four of chapter six, the definite integral from an algebraic viewpoint. And of course, the fundamental theorem of calculus. So in this class, we are going to learn about the fundamental theorem of calculus, and this is gonna help bridge the definite and indefinite integrals, AKA of course, antiderivatives, right? So when you're bringing up the fundamental theorem of calculus, you have to think, wait, what? wait a minute. They're fundamental theorems, right? Uh, what was the fundamental theorem of algebra? Or what was the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? And the claim is they do exist and they're out there and I've included some Wikipedia links. Uh, this is definitely diverging from the direction that we're heading. Uh, but if you're interested, you should definitely check them out, right? Uh, I guess I can just say the fundamental theorem of algebra tells you about factoring polynomials and how many factors there'll be. Uh, Fundamental theorem of arithmetic has something to do with prime uh, decompositions, right? So every number can be written as a product of primes and things like this. So anyway, we're here to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the fundamental theorem of calculus, sometimes this is denoted FTC or sometimes FTOC, things like this. It deals with uh, when you have a nice derivative that's continuous. And of course, we're specifying an interval here from A to B. And in this case, if you want to calculate out the definite integral, so the definite integral from a to b of f prime of t dt, the way to do this is by taking a difference of the antiderivatives values at b and at a. So f of b minus f of a. Moreover, the antiderivative f is, of course, guaranteed to exist. And that's kind of uh, relying on the fact that you have a nice continuous function. So this is a new slick way to calculate out in, sorry, <laughs> definite integrals algebraically. So let's show you how it's done. We have this nice definite integral here, one minus two X on the interval from one to four. And I'd like to calculate this out using uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we have to pretend right here that this is some derivative function. This is F prime of, I guess, X in this case, right? Not T anymore, but X is our independent variable. And so if, We'll say f, f prime of x is equal to this 1 minus 2x. Then we can calculate out uh, the indefinite integral, or particularly just any old antiderivative is fine. So the antiderivative f of x is equal to, OK, I need something that when I take the derivative of it, I get 1. So that's going to be x. And I need something that when I take the derivative of it, I get uh, 2x. So that's gonna be x squared. So double check, if I take the derivative of this, do I get back to where I started? Do I get one minus two x? Yes, absolutely. So this is an, an antiderivative. And so I've just calculated out my capital F. So if I want to evaluate the integral from one to four of one minus two x dx, then this is going to be equal to F of b, that's gonna be my four, F of four, minus f of one. So f of four, well, that's just me plugging in four everywhere in my antiderivative. So this is going to be, ah, oops, there we go. So four minus four squared minus uh, f of one. So f of one, if I plug it in one. And so the big thing here is that you do have to subtract away all of f of 1. So I'm going to include the parentheses right now. A common mistake is just that you, know, you forget these parentheses and you accidentally only subtract away the first term. So f of 1, 1 minus 1 squared will be 1. Right? So if you only applied the negative to the first one, that would be bad. OK, so 4 minus 16 is going to be negative 12. And then 1 minus 1 will be 0, so minus 0. So the answer here is negative 12. Okay, now this is what I claim to be true, but let's actually check, right? We have a way to check this on our calculator. So let me go ahead and bring up our calculator again. And I'm going to use the f int thing here. So I know that's 9. So I just hit that f int. And let's see, my function is 1 minus 2x, 1 minus 2 uh, times x. And let's see, I'm integrating with respect to x, so comma x, and I'm doing this from zero, oh, no, no, to one uh, to four, one to four. Close parentheses, hit enter, and the answer is negative 12. So indeed, plugging this into our calculator, we get negative 12 as well. Negative 12, happy face. Okay, so these things actually match up, 
and you can see that uh, now we have more of a, uh, an algebraic way to actually solve um, definite integrals. So these are this is a very powerful theorem, right? Because remember, before we had to use lots of rectangles and stuff, and it was it was a bit of a pain. So this is very, very powerful stuff, actually. Okay, let's actually see it applied. Um, and the emphasis here that I want to put on this example is something is, uh, right, it doesn't matter which antiderivative you choose, right? So before, we found an antiderivative, x minus x squared, but there are many antiderivatives. Uh, so one question you might have, well, if you chose a different one, would it matter? And the claim is that it doesn't. Uh, and so let me actually demonstrate this for you and with a new problem. So we have this function g of t, which is uh, e to the t plus uh, root t. So I'm going to suppose that this is some derivative function. And say, instead of maybe using uh, f's, I'm going to use g's, right, because I already have this g. So suppose that this is some g prime of t. So I need to figure out the antiderivative. So I find an antiderivative of g of t. So if this is true, then capital G of t would be equal to, okay, an antiderivative of e to the t is just itself, right? That's the uh, e to the x or e to the t rule. And then this one right here, ah, well, this is t to the 1 half power, t to the 1 half power. Remember, that's the same thing as the square root, t to the 1 half power. So in order to figure out the antiderivative of this, I'm going to use the power rule, right? Which says that I should increase my exponent by 1. So instead of 1 half, I need to add 1 to that. So that's 1 and a half, which is, of course, the same thing as 3 halves. And then I need to divide by my new exponent. So this is 1 divided by 3 halves. And of course, if you check, if you take the derivative of this, you'll get back to where you started. So this is an antiderivative. So the claim is then the integral from 0 to 4 of g of t dt is equal to g of 4 minus g of 0. All right? And so g of 4, well, this is a little bit more complicated. Let me actually use my calculator for this. I'm going to go ahead and plug in my um, antiderivative into the grapher here. So this is going to be e to the x plus 1 divided by uh, 3 halves, which is, of course, the same thing as 1.5, times x to the 3 halves. Remember, it's important to use parentheses here, uh, 3 halves, which is, of course, again, the same thing as 1.5. I'll just use that. OK. So that, again, I'm plugging in my antiderivative because I'd like to figure out g of 4 and g of 0. And this would be a little bit faster. So now let me go ahead and look at my table. Do, 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 do. So g of 0, oh, it's just 1. That's pretty slick. And how about g of 4? Ooh, that's a little bit nastier, 59.931. So 53.931 minus g of 0, g of 0, which is, of course, was 1 go ahead, double check, make sure that I didn't write anything down incorrectly. Oh, 59.931. Ah, I'm glad I checked. 59.931. So when you subtract these, you're going to get 58.931 as your final answer. Okay. So like I said, this is with an antiderivative. Now let me show you if you found a different antiderivative. So for instance, if you did g of t equals e to the t plus 1 over 3 halves t to the 3 halves. Remember, all antiderivatives, they kind of look like this, but then you can add any constant that you want here. So if I add the constant, <laughs> let's do 7. Why not? So here is a different antiderivative. And now I would like to evaluate out this, which is, again, the integral from 0 to 4 of our little g of t dt. So this is going to be our new g of 4 minus g of 0. And let's see what this is equal to. So let me go back, y equals, and I'm going to go ahead and plug in this plus 7, right? And you can choose your own different one if you'd like. And let me go back to the table. And so the table, at 0 it's now 8, which kind of makes sense. And then at 4, it's 66.931.
So 66.931 minus 8, which, let's be extra careful, 66.931 minus 8 equals 58.931. 58.931. And so you can see that it really does not matter which antiderivative you use, any of them will give you the same result, 58.931. OK, so that's very nice. Now you see how you can use the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, to evaluate out definite integrals very quickly uh, and algebraically. So this is now kind of a better way to show our work. Let's do one more example here, example 4.4. Notice I've given you the derivative graph here, so f prime of x. This is not f, shown below. Use the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, along with the table of values here, uh, knowing that f of 2 equals 5. And I like to fill in the other ones. OK, so let me start off with a relatively easy one and kind of show you how this works. We know that according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, for instance, that if I was to integrate the definite integral from 2 to 3 of the derivative function here, that this should be equal to, again, according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, f of 3 minus f of 2. Now, we actually already know f of 2. It's equal to 5, right? So this is f of 3 minus 5. OK. Now, I can calculate out this definite integral because this is just net area under the curve, or area between f of x and, uh, sorry, f prime of x and uh, the x-axis. So if I was to try to figure out the area under the curve from 2 to 3, so that's this area right here, is what I want to figure out. Well, I can do that, right? Because it's the shape of a triangle. We know that it has width 1, it has height 1, or really, if you'd like, negative 1. Remember, it's below the x-axis, so you need to count it negatively. So this is going to be 1 half base times height. OK, so that's going to be negative 1 half. So therefore, f of 3, we could rearrange this, right? We could add 5 to both sides, and you get 5 minus 1 half, a.k.a. 4.5. So 3 is going to be 4.5, right? f of 3, 4.5. All right. Now, let's go ahead and do f of 4. So if I wanted to do f of 4, let's consider the integral from 2 to 4 of f prime of x dx, for instance. Well, this is going to be f of 4 minus f of 2. Remember, I already know what f of 2 is. It's 5. And I'm trying to figure out what f of 4 is. Well, this is going to be the area, or the net area, under the curve from 2 to 4 of the derivative function. Well, here's the derivative function. So now I go from 2 all the way up to 4. So I want to include all of this area right here. Well, this, again, is a triangle, right? So this triangle now has base length 2. It has height negative 2. 2 or negative 2, right, depending on how you're considering that uh, this is negative. And then, so the area is going to be 1 half base times height. So this is going to be negative 2 is equal to f of 4 minus 5. Let me add the 5 to the other side. So 5 minus 2 is going to be 3. OK. Now. Let me go in the other direction for a second, right? I'll finish up 5 and 6 in just a second here. But let me go in this other direction. Maybe if I want to figure out what f of 1 is, right? So in this case, I would do the integral from 1 to 2 of f prime of x dx. That's supposed to be f of 2 minus f of 1, right? Well, f of 2 I know. It's 5 f of 1 is the thing that I'm trying to solve for. And so this is the integral, aka the area under, f prime of x and the x-axis. So from 1 to 2. There we go. So this has height 2, base 1. It's a triangle, so 1 half base times height. And so you get out 1. 
and 5 minus f of 1. So now we need to rearrange. We can get f of 1 is equal to 5 minus 1. That's going to be 4. So f of 1 is going to be equal to 4 in this case. All right. Let me do maybe one more, and then I'll tell you the answers to the others, because this is kind of repetitive. Um, let me try for 5 here. Okay. So for 5, notice I've been kind of starting over at 2 each time. But you don't need to necessarily do that. Let me actually go from 4 to 5. So long as you're pretty confident in your answer to 4, this will work out. All right, so I'm going to do the uh, antiderivative, or sorry, the definite integral from 4 to 5 of f prime of x dx. This should be equal to f of 5 minus f of 4. f of 4, we already know, it's equal to 3 f of 5 is the thing that we're trying to solve for right now. And the area under the curve, right, from 4 to 5. So, oh, you can see this actually switches, right? So part of the time it's underneath, and then part of the time it's above. So notice that this area up here will be counted positively. It's above the x-axis. And this stuff down here below the x-axis will be counted negatively. Interestingly enough, it seems like there's an equal amount of positive area and negative area, but let's double check and calculate it out anyway. So here our uh, triangle has base 1 half, that's for the negative part. The other part also has base 1 half. Here we have a height of 2, and here we have a height of negative 2, right? Or if you'd like to, you think triangle length should be positive, you say it's 2, but it's counted negatively. So therefore, we have our definite integral from 4 to 5 will be 1 half, right, base times height. So base times height, that's going to be negative 2 for the red triangle. And then 1 half base times height, positive 2 for the green triangle. f of 5, that's the thing that we're interested in, and f of 4 is 3. So here we have negative 1 half, cancels down a little bit, 1 half equals f of 5 minus 3. So yes, the negative half and the positive half, just like I thought, cancel out. And so we get f of 5 equals 3. So these happen to be the same. Okay, I think you've probably had enough of this, and in the idea of saving a little bit of time, I thought I'd go ahead and just tell you that here we have 4.5. You should go ahead and think about that a little bit, why this would be the case. And then back here, if you want f of 0, this is going to be 2.5. So again, think about this using the same sort of reasoning that we had uh, down here in the bottom left. All right, that is the end of this video, the first part of 6.4. I'll see you guys next time uh, for part 2. See you then.